have come to the end of another year. And when that means it's time for me to give some of my favorites of all of the shows that I've watched this past year that came out this year, as opposed to back catalog stuff. That's another matter. Um, as with all my previous lists that I've done, these are not in any particular order. Um, I normally don't do things that way. And I am limiting myself to shows that I have watched this year. So there are some really great shows like 86 and Odd Taxi that I haven't had a chance to watch. They're on my on Mount uh, watch list, but then but I haven't watched them myself yet. So they will. Um, so I will get to them at another time. But in the meantime, for this video, um, also, while this is coming out at the end of the year, approximately like the week of Christmas, I am recording this in the tail in November. So some of the shows I'm talking about are still airing as I record. Well, one of them is, but that one's going to be wrapping up more or less this week. Um, and I don't see this one messing the bed, but it's entirely possible that it could manage to spectacularly step on the rake or a whole field of rakes in the last episode. But in the meantime, otherwise, everything else I have seen in its entirety before I've recorded this video. But as it is, I've watched considerably more than these shows this year. These are just the six that came to mind in terms of highlights of the year. If you don't see a particular show mentioned, and it's not one that I've specifically called out as um, something that I haven't gotten around to, or if it's one that I have reviewed or have seen, but haven't, I'm not talking about here because you've followed me on analyst or whatever um please check out the blog at count to zero or.com i do written reviews of absolutely every anime i watch with all that out of the way let's get started first off we have fruits basket the final season this show did a tremendous job of building to a profound sense of catharsis for the main characters of the show and ultimately giving toru honda the climax to her character arc that if you read the manga, you'd gotten years ago, but if you were just stuck with the anime, you'd been waiting for for years, decades even. And honestly, truly need to be adapted. If your only exposure to the character had been the first original series or the first season, you may very much have assumed that Toru was nothing more than a passive doormat character, with the majority of narrative agency being the characters around her. And the last two seasons of the show, and especially the final season, really get across who Toru is and what she is capable of, both in terms of deep kindness, but also a deep sense of, of will and a toughness and durability for her, uh, a willingness to emotionally, if not physically, go 10 rounds for the sake of getting her friends out of, emotion, out of emotionally or even physically abusive or otherwise toxic situations. And this season is where that really comes across. And speaking of climax of character arcs, our, my second pick, Evangelion 3.0 plus 1.0 Thrice Upon the Time, does a similar job of giving a sense of emotional catharsis that we've been waiting for for years, in this case, to Shinji and Asuka and Rei, and even, for that matter, Misato. There isn't time in Dustus 1 video to fully cover this topic at in enough length to do it justice. Other better video producers than I, Giguk and Mother's Basement, have done 15, 20 minutes on this. Podcasters have spent hours talking about this movie um, and not in a, I'm just reiterating the same points over and over. It's having some really deep, intelligent, very well done conversations on this. And I can't do justice to this to the discussion here, but I will try to sum up as best I can. Um, also, I will add, I did do a fairly long blog post on this on the blog. There'll be a link to that in the doobly-doo, which is the more at length version. But all of that in short, EVA 3.0 plus 1.0 is a film that really presents all the themes about emotional openness, communication, and empathy, and the importance of that being willing to accept that opening ourselves up to others puts us at risk of being hurt, but that's okay. And also not also letting us define ourselves on our own terms and not just on what other people want us to be all through 
again, a, sense, a great sense of warmth and humanity that leaves left me and from the accounts I'm seeing other members of the audience in a sense, not of shock and rawness, like what End of Evangelion did, but a sense of warmth and catharsis um, that left you going with like a bit of a bittersweet smile rather than just kind of being stuck in your chair trying to wrap your head around what you just saw like with End of Evangelion. End of Eva was angry and upset and, and to a certain degree nihilistic. Thrice Upon a Time left me with the sensation of these characters can be okay. These characters will be okay and can have a set have a future ahead of them. And if they can, so can I. Number three, the Heike story. There are times when my moderate knowledge of medieval Japanese history uh, can have be something of a bane when it comes to taking part in discussions of a particular show, especially when people are trying to avoid spoilers. In the case of the Heike story, we have director Naoko Yamada and anime studio Science Saru doing an adaptation of a classic work of Japanese historical literature, uh, he uh, Heike Monogatari, and then combining elements of the original text along with other elements, new elements, which help ground and humanize historical figures that appear in it, all of which is done with absolutely gorgeous animation, writing, and acting. And in discussion of the show, I found myself running into a bunch of people who didn't know about the historical events and who, in order to preserve the sense of suspense, were electing to remain ignorant. Meanwhile, I'm sitting over here, having read a whole bunch of books about the samurai, which covered this period when I was in middle school and high school, and even if I hadn't read those, I'd also watch Carl Sagan's Cosmos, which, in a discussion about genetics, inherited traits, and artificial selection, gets into the Heike Crabs, and with it a depiction of the events of the Battle of Dano Ura, which concludes um, the Genpei War, and is the end of the Heike clan. And also on top of that, I've reviewed Kwaidan, which includes the tale of uh, Hoishi the Earlets, who also recounts the, the story of the Battle of Dano Ura to the ghosts of the heads of the, he of the Heike clan, which also is, includes a depiction of the battle once again. So, I spent the entire show looking at the comments from a distance, like someone listening to water cooler conversations about HBO's Rome and hearing people go, man, you know, this Mark Antony is kind of a neat guy. I hope nothing bad happens to him. And knowing that this show was always meant to be a tragedy from the get go. And the Japanese audience to at least an extent knew that going in as well. So I love the show a great deal. But the comment, but following the discussion did involve a certain degree of, of cringe that is certainly not the show's fault, but was unintentionally amusing on my end. Number four, Vlad Love. On a lighter note, in 2021, we had a major comeback. Mamoru Oshii is a director who hasn't done much in terms of TV anime for decades. Now he's done anime films, However, those anime films what you've done were are generally more serious and somber works. You know, Ghost in the Shell, the Pat Labor films, um, writing the um, Jinro the Wolf Brigade, and also, for that matter, Blood the Last Vampire, and Angel's Egg, and that sort of thing. Indeed, I would argue that Oshi has been doing dramatic works, serious dramatic works for long enough and their success has been pronounced enough that it is easy to forget that Oshi's earliest directorial work includes Arusa Yatsura and even after some of his more dramatic stuff like the Pat Labor movies came out he was still writing some occasional comedy including some of the funniest episodes of the Pat Labor the Mobile Police TV series and OVA spinoff that said again probably for most younger generations these days Oshi is known as a serious, somber, stoic, grim director of animation. 
So when Vladlov was announced and that does the Oshi is doing TV again, or at least a series again, and he's doing comedy. I was looking forward to this because I wanted to know, does he still have it? Has his, or has his funny bone become so ossified and arthritic that he can no longer exercise that sense of comedy. And I was overjoyed to see that he can still, that he can still do it. He still got it. Vlad love leans into its absurdism hard with as much as with Oshi's episodes of Yurusa Yatsura, the show never letting episode to episode continuity get in the way of a good joke inside episode continuity. Absolutely sticks around there, but Otherwise, between episodes, it doesn't really matter that, you know, we just like had a military intervention and people launching missiles at our one of that our um one of our vampire main character who was grown to kaiju size because next episode everything's back to normal because that was done for a joke. And let us never speak of that again. Or if we do speak of it again, it'll be to set up another joke. And on top of this, the show uses a fair amount of very just gorgeously animated, spectacularly over-the-top slapstick, all combined with, again, very absurdist uh, imagery, among which, like, we get, like, a lampooning of fan service in the first episode with the school nurse just kind of, for, like, one shot, just being naked with sensor, with sensor bars over the appropriate naughty bits, with text on it reading artistically necessary, which is just chef's kiss. In short, this show is just a giant pile of absurdist comedy, and I am here for it. Number five, Girlfriend, Girlfriend. Probably the next step on the absurdist comedy or romantic comedy for me was Girlfriend, Girlfriend, a harem romantic comedy that starts from the perspective of what if you had a romantic comedy where the jokes were born not from people failing to share information leading to hilarious misunderstandings and instead based on oversharing leading to hilarious reactions. On the one hand, it's the show relying heavily on one joke, but when it's a good joke, you can do a lot of variations on it. It's the same way with this year's other big show way of the house husband, where the joke is you don't expect a badass ex Yakuza to be good at domestic tax because tasks because of toxic masculinity or in science fell in love. So we tried to prove it where the joke is, what if we tried to prove romantic attraction using the scientific method? In this case, we have our male need lead, Noya, who has just confessed to his new girlfriend, Saki, and they've been going out for an unspecified period when another classmate, Nagisa, confesses him with a Michelin star grade bento that she spent weeks training to make. So Noya, demonstrating that he's perhaps a distant relative of the Baldrick family, has a cunning plan plan so cunning that you could mistake it for a kitsune. What if Noya, Saki, and Nagisa form a polycule, all three of them in a relationship together? After some initial hostility, to put it mildly, Saki warms up to the idea after getting to know Nagisa, and things just get sillier and sillier from there, as other characters try to worm into the relationship or risk discovering the relationship um, leading to social issues related to that, forcing our protagonist to have to perform Herculean feats to try and cover it up. It is a level of farce that we haven't really gotten since 2017's Gamers. Something at a level that were William Shakespeare alive today with more modern sensitivities regarding romantic relationships, well, sensibilities as well, regarding romantic relationships, he honestly probably would have come up with something like that for a play. And Lit Majors, before you cry heresy, reread some of the comedies again. Bill could get and did get pretty damn lowbrow. He just executed it really well. Before number six, some quick honorable mentions. Now, Thunderbolt Fantasy Season 3 has some of the best writing of the series thus far, with some incredibly well-executed plotting of the series and plots by the characters including some excellent further developments in the character of um, Gang Wu Lao, along with one of probably the enigmatic Gale's best plans to date in the series. It's also a Taiwanese glove puppet series, which, while written by Gen Urabuchi, with 
Good Smile Company helping with the character design certainly makes it anime adjacent. It technically isn't animated. That said, I would put this as one of my top general shows of the year. And honestly, if you're not watching Thunderbolt Fantasy, you really need to. You're probably already subscribed to Crunchyroll anyway, so you have access to this. Go watch it. Now, I liked Get a Robo Arc a lot, but I also came in having read a bunch of the manga beforehand and with full awareness that there is a degree of jank in the animation reflective of some of, I guess you would call it the looseness of Kenny Shikawa's art from the manga that some people would probably just bounce off of. For me, this was my jam, but I'm aware that it also might not be a lot of other people's and it makes it a much more of an acquired taste recommendation. Now, I got into Combatants Will Be Dispatched in the first part of my Anime Appendix N uh, fantasy videos. Part two will be next year. But this show felt like a lot of a crasser um, anime version of what your middle school or high school D&D campaign might actually have been like, where everyone is some degree of assholes, but you're all assholes fighting the bad guys, or at least worse guys, with the degree of sort of crassness with the sense of, and looseness with the sense of humor there. And my last honorable mention, Leg Bank Camp Season 2, was it's more of what made Leg Bank Camp Season 1 good, with a couple twists, well, twist is the wrong term, but fun bits with episodes based around characters messing up camping, which actually, for any inform informative or instructional show about a thing, it is important to present the idea that you can screw up and that's okay. So my hat is off to Leg Bank Camp Season 2 for doing that. Number six is Other Side Picnic. One of the films I've come very much to love after having subscribed to the Criterion channel years ago was the film Stalker by Andrei Tartofsky. Other Side Picnic is a film that takes the concept from that work, it's, its own form of the zone, in this case a supernatural realm known as The Other Side, where various entities inspired, and inspired by and derived from urban legends and myths exist, but also which visually resembles the inside of the zone from Stalker. However, Other Side Picnic, instead of having the, the um, pilgrimage narrative from Tartofsky's film, the narrative is very much more one of exploration, to a degree um, environmental exploration as metaphor as other forms of explanation in the same way of the pilgrimage, um, the journey to inside the zone with the uh, being a metaphorical and literal pilgrimage and regarding inter regarding discussions of faith in that film. I realize I may be reading a bit too much into it, but that's okay. That's what I do. Only, only the explorations here and other side picnic, it's exploration of the self as our main character, um, Sorowo contends with her own internal crises over the course of the series. And also exploration of relationships with others, both in friendly terms and in the case of our protagonists, again, Soro and her uh, friend, potentially more, uh, at least emotionally, uh, Toriko, romantic terms. The show is not flawless. It, adjusts the timeline of the novels in ways that makes things unnecessarily shuffled and doesn't fit the order of events well, it, narratively. But otherwise, it's a fantastic show. While the ending of the series is inconclusive, the light novel series picks up beyond that point and has been licensed for U.S. release, so it's available if you want to go read it. So if you, in the event that you finish the series and find yourself wanting more, Hopefully we do get a second season of this show because this is something I would definitely be interested in picking up more of. Now, links to all of the shows that I have covered this episode can be found in the show notes as well. When situ circumstances where they are available for purchase, I will have affiliate links for those shows or in the or if they're in the case of um, Evangelion, it'll be the link to the Amazon streaming page for it. So, in the meantime, um, here's looking forward to another year of really good, solid anime and hopefully us being able to go to even more conventions in the year to come. Until next time, K.
Catch you later. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. <laughs>